Good evening. If you want to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, we're going to spend our time there this evening. Uh, tonight, as you see on the screen uh, above me, we're looking at a 2,000-year-old prayer in 2023. Uh, you might think, or some might think, maybe not you, that something written down or said 2,000 years ago isn't very relevant or applicable um, today. However, uh, we believe differently that the Word of God is always relevant. It's always needed. It always applies to our situation. And, and tonight we're looking at a prayer said by the Apostle Paul that he said about a group of Christians in a place he had not been to that I believe he would still pray today about many churches. Uh, this prayer is still as relevant today as it was then. And it's very applicable to different groups of people, especially to those who are young in the faith. Uh, as Mike mentioned, we had three... We've had three individuals baptized in a week. And that's incredible. We've had people visiting. We've had other people who've been, uh, who have started their walk with Jesus recently, just in the last few months and year. And I don't know at what age you become mature in the faith. So many of us are young in our faith. And this absolutely applies. Um, this prayer does to those individuals. And you mentioned Gabby this morning. She's sitting in the back. And I'm not going to make her stand or do anything awkward. But she's here. And we're so happy for you, Gabby. Um, and so this applies to you and many others, uh, but it also applies to those of us who might be further along in our faith, who aren't uh, recently uh, new to Jesus, who didn't start just this past year. But it's a reminder for us who are more mature of what our life should look like in Christ and what our priorities should be. I mean, what are some things that we need to make important uh, on a daily and weekly basis? And so as we start, Paul wrote this letter to a, a church that... According to what I know, he had not visited before. Uh, we don't see, I believe, in the book of Acts, Paul visiting Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. I guess he could have visited, uh, and we don't have it recorded, but I don't think that's the case. He doesn't make mention in this letter of being with them uh, physically before. And he talks about this group of people, and he, he's talking about the hope that they have because of the gospel. He says in verse 5 of chapter 1, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. And he would go on to say a few verses later in 7 and 8, Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Paul knew of this church because of his friend Epaphras, his, his fellow servant, another worker for the Lord, a minister, a missionary of some sorts. Paul is in prison in Rome, and Epaphras has come and visited him, it seems, or has written to him. And he's made him known about, hey, there's this group of Christians in Colossae you need to hear about. And you should speak to them. You should write them a letter, since you can't visit at this very moment. Epaphras wrote to Paul because of this. It would say in chapter 4 of Colossians, in verse 12, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he, worked, he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hier Hierapolis. Hierapolis, I don't know how to say that, that city. Um, but it's this idea of, hey, you have this minister, this missionary. He's helped teach them the gospel. And he's a worker. He's a servant of the Lord. And it says he's always struggling that they may be fully mature. Uh, when you're a preacher or a minister or a missionary, your goal simply isn't to just get people wet. You know, hey, let's just get them to get baptized. You, you long for them to grow up, to become strong in their faith. Think about your children. Don't you have dreams for them when they're born? You know, I hope they grow up to be healthy, strong, independent people, those who rely on God. But you pray that they uh, accomplish all that they can. They're responsible. They're good moral people. You have all these goals. I want them to grow up and be mature and that's the prayer that Epaphras has for these Christians that he feels like, in a way, I'm the father of their faith. And so he says, Paul, I could use your help, maybe. I've, there's these great group of Christians. Uh, would you write to them? And so Paul does, just to give you reference, from Rome to where Colossae is, is about 1,300 miles. If you just go 1,300 miles north from here, you're somewhere between Manitoba and Winnipeg, Canada, for the five or six of you that might know or that is off the top of your head. That's a far ways away. Um, and yet Paul knew of their faith. Um, Paul had heard of their faith despite being that far away. 
You know, one interesting thought that's not the lesson tonight is, but what do people hear about us? You know, we have an impact as a congregation far, be, far beyond just this community. It should start here, but people maybe know about us. Or maybe we go and tell their people about each other and about this congregation. Well, what do they know? Well, it's people here. And that's a, that's a cool idea that churches have reputations. That's a good thing, but it could be a bad thing too, depending on uh, how you live as a, as a body of people. And so that far away, Paul had heard about them. And he writes to these young Christians, and uh, it's at the beginning of the chapter, he has a prayer for them. And I want you to notice uh, with me, uh, you find in this prayer a what he is asking for. You find a why, the reason he asked for it. You find a what for what, what it looks like if they were to, if God was to fulfill this request and these individuals were to do what he's asking for. And so let's just start here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, notice, his prayer for these Christians was for them to be filled. He says, I pray you may be filled. Look at verse 9 with me. And so from the day we heard, that's him and the, his companions, we have not ceased to pray for you. Here's the underlying part. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. If you pause right there, just notice, he asked God that they, these Christians would be filled with knowledge. That is the first request he makes on their behalf. I think we understand this concept of being filled quite well in America. Uh, you can supersize any meal you want anywhere, can't you? You can probably supersize a supersize if you want. That might be a thing. Uh, you can binge watch a show in a day or a weekend if you so desire. I mean, we, however as much as you want of something, you can get it here. Uh, Halloween is coming up. I would imagine our children are not going to come home with a bag that's one-fourth of the way filled. That thing is going to be loaded up beyond belief. Like the little circular thing they hold on to, that thing is going to be struggling to, to maintain its uh, structural integrity at the end of that night. They have, we fill up to the brim. And this idea of filled means to be bubbling over. That's this connotation that this word gives, to bubble over. When you go to a restaurant and you go to get your fountain drink and you go to that machine and you fill it up, you know what I'm talking about. You get Probably a Dr. Pepper if you're a good person. You might get something else if uh, that was a cheap pop. I appreciate that cheap laugh. Um, but you go and you get your drink and as you pour it, you have to be careful because what is it going to do? It's going to bubble over. And so uh, you have to kind of pause and wait for the carbonation to go down about 17 times. But you want to fill your drink up. That's this idea of it. It is so filled that it bubbles over. That's this idea Paul's trying to get across. And I pray you'll be filled. That you be filled with the knowledge of, Hill and a, of his will in a way that it will bubble over into the way you live. And that's the idea he's trying to get across. Uh, he, wants you, he wants these Christians to be filled with God's word, with their will. Um, one interesting thing is we don't come to God with an empty cup, though. You know, a restaurant, we go to be filled up, and it's empty. But for you and I, uh, we come to God with a cup filled with our own will, in a way, don't we? Uh, we come to God already with some baggage and struggling with our own self and the things we might desire. And I know as a Christian, you've said, I give up my desires to pursue your, but that's a, to pursue his. But that's a lifelong process, isn't it, of getting rid of our will and then getting God's will in us. And so we come to God with an already filled cup in a way, and we have to pour ourselves out, but then fill ourselves with his will. And how we fill ourselves with his will or how we fill ourselves with him and, and fulfill our cup is coming to his word. Um, you know, we're always being filled in this life, one way or the other. We're filling ourselves with something. And he says, you need to fill yourself uh, with his will. Nobody can fill your cup but you. Nobody can fill your cup but you. Um, you cannot fill me spiritually. You cannot make God's word a priority in my life, and I cannot make it a priority in yours. I cannot make those decisions for you to get God's word in your life on a consistent basis, and you can't do that for me. But as a Christian, it is vital that we're doing that. And that sounds basic, right? Every lesson you've heard from the beginning seems to be read your Bible, pray every day, and grow, grow, grow. We sing that to our young little kids. But it's vitally important that we do, and he'll go on to say why. But no one can fill it for us. We are responsible for our own growth. We're responsible for filling ourselves. You know, our young people, as a parent, we're responsible for that, for filling them. But at some point, they become responsible for themselves. But just notice first, he says, I pray that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will. You've got to be filled. 
And then he gets to the why, because that's the what. And the why here is in verse 10, and he says, I pray you'd be filled so you would live a life pleasing to God. Paul prayed these Christians would be filled so they would please God in their life. Look at verse 10. He says, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So, there's your why, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Fully pleasing to him. Did you know that there is a way God desires for you and I to walk? There's a lifestyle God intends for us to live. He has desires that way. It's not just however we want to live goes. But there actually is a way for you and I to live. And if we're going to know how to live, we're going to need his will to describe and define that for us. Uh, Paul said, I, I want you to be filled because there is no way for you to live a life that is pleasing to God if you don't know what that looks like. If you don't know what that is. If you don't know what my will is. Uh, you can know. And here's what's tricky about this. You can know God's will and not live a life pleasing to God. You can know all the stories of the Bible. You can give me all the facts of it and you can still not follow it or do it. At the same, on the flip side though, you really cannot live a life pleasing to God if you don't know his will. I mean, just think about that. Husbands, how can you please your spouse, your wife, if you don't know what makes her happy? Some of you are going, I don't know what makes her happy. So I'm still trying to figure that out. But how can you make someone pleased if you don't know what pleases them? Uh, that's just, that's obvious. And for God, it's the same way. How can I know how to live for God without the knowledge of, of his will, without him telling me and instructing me of what it is that pleases him? So you can know all these things and not do it. But at the same time, you can't live a life pleasing to God uh, without his will. And so he says, I, I want you to fill yourself. You need to fill yourself so you can live in a way that's worthy of God's calling. Because when you fill yourself, it will change the way you live. When you fill yourself, it will change the way you walk. Have you ever been walking with a cup that's way too filled with no lid on it? If I was walking with a cup that was halfway filled, I would be casual. Uh, I would just leisurely stroll. I'm not very worried about it's spilling anywhere. But have you ever overfilled a cup to the top? You walk differently, don't you? You just, you kind of, your hand starts maybe shaking a bit. You know, you, I don't want to spill it on anything or the carpet or in the car or whatever. If you ever got a drink and it's all on top of the lid when they hand it to you in a drive through you can tell I love drive throughs uh, You just, I don't want to spill it. It's bubbling over. And that's the idea here. When you're filled, it will change the way you walk. When God's will is in you so much it, and you're filling yourself, it will bubble over to how you live and how you treat people and how you talk and, and how you handle the situations in your life. Um, if we don't know his will, how can we ever live in a way that pleases him? So we have to be filled. Have you ever seen those commercials for Snickers? Uh, you're not you when you're hungry. You ever seen those? It's like this girl's complaining and the guy's like in the locker room like, eat this, and the girl turns into a guy, he's like, you're not you when you're hungry. Listen, you're not very Jesus-like when you're not filled, when you are unfulfilled. When God's word is not in your life, or his will in some ways not in your life, it's not being put into your mind and heart, you're usually not very Jesus-like. And so he says, you need to be filled in order to live a life pleasing to God. And that's a lifelong pursuit. In the same way that you pursue your spouse for life, you have to pursue God for life, for life. You have to continue to learn his will, his desires, and pursue him to be reminded of it over and over again. It takes a dedicated effort. God is interested in our transformation, not only us knowing information. If we come here and we learn a lot and we take it and we don't do anything with it, God's not very interested in that. If we're in our Bibles every week and we learn a lot, but we don't do anything with it, I would argue we haven't learned a lot. Teaching and God's word is meant to transform people. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the purpose of teaching and preaching. That's the purpose of learning God's word, that it transforms us. And so we need it, though, to be transformed. He says, you have to be filled in order to live a life that is pleasing to God. But we can't be transformed without it. You do need it. 
You need God's word to transform you. That's the goal, and you can't do it without it. And so he says, what? Be filled. Why? So you can live a life pleasing to him. And then what I love about Paul is he doesn't say, hey, go live a life pleasing to God. Good luck. But he says, no, this is what it looks like. And so uh, he prayed what this pleasing life would look like. Here's, what, here's an idea of what a pleasing life to God looks like. Check out verse 10. Uh, just we'll read to the end, verse 10 to verse 14. So he says, Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you notice, there are the words highlighted all end in ing. Uh, they're, they're participles in language. That means they are actions. And God says, here are four actions that show you what a pleasing life to God looks like. Uh, first, he would say, bearing fruit. God desires Christians who produce something. I don't mean that in a works-based salvation way, but God... But God's word and God himself is meant to transform our life, that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we should walk in them. He wants us to be producing for him the right attitudes, the heart, uh, our works, things of that nature. Uh, just how a tree needs to be filled with all the right nutrients to produce, a Christian needs to be filled, produced. Uh, this all goes back to what he asked for, that you can't really be a productive Christian if you're not being filled that is like trying to run a marathon without eating for a week. That's like trying to drive a car when you have no gas in it. That's, uh, you can't live a pleasing life to God if your spiritual tank is on E. It's, it's impossible. And so you have to be filling yourself. If we had a tree, if you had a plant in your garden that wasn't producing, you would say, I think something is wrong. How many Christians today aren't producing? You know, maybe something is wrong there. If our child wasn't growing, we would, we would take our child to the doctor. If our car wasn't running right, we would get it checked out. What if we're not producing? Maybe we're not filling ourselves with the right stuff. Um, how do we react if that's the case? Um, most of the time, most of the time, we aren't producing or fruitful for Jesus is typically the time where we're not prioritizing putting God in our life on a consistent basis. Uh, when we're not being filled... That's usually when we're not being very fruitful for Jesus. And so there are all kinds of good works to be active. And he says, I want a pleasing life to God looks like someone who is bearing fruit in every good work. Notice number two, increasing in the knowledge of God. Well, that fits what we've been talking about. Be filled with the knowledge of his will. But notice there's a difference. He said earlier, be filled with the knowledge of his will. And he, here he says, a life pleasing to God is increasing in the knowledge of God. Not that he wants you necessarily to memorize every word of this book just to know it factually, like an encyclopedia in your head. But he says, I want you to know his will and ult ultimately so that you will know God. There is a difference between knowing all the facts of God's story and knowing God himself. So I want you to come to know him. And so this, he says, a part of a pleasing life to God is increasing in the knowledge of him. Uh, you like being pursued. So does God. God enjoys that too. Um, somebody trying to get to know you is pleasing. It, it's nice when people take an interest in you, isn't it? You know, instead of walking by and saying, hey, how are you? And they don't even continue the conversation. It's, hey, no, hey, how was your week? Oh, what would you do? Well, what are you interested in? Getting to know someone, it's nice. God appreciates when people really take the time to get to know him. And they spend time investing in him. And it pleases him to increase in the knowledge of him. Uh, and so he says, notice there's four of them. Bearing fruit, increasing in the knowledge. And then third, giving thanks to the Father. Or I'm sorry, I skipped one. Just kidding. It's, it's nap time maybe, I don't know. Uh, back up. Third one, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. God takes pleasure when we are strengthened by him. Being filled is meant to strengthen us. It all goes back to that. When you're filled, you are a stronger Christian. 
And you absolutely need to be filled and to be strong because this walk is not easy. He says, being, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for what? All endurance and patience. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And you're going to have to put the right stuff in you to keep this motor moving. You're going to have to put the right stuff in you to walk in a pleasing way for God. And so he says, I, I take great pleasure by someone who's being strengthened. Um, who's being strengthened by his power. A Christian who neglects the word of God is like a phone that's not plugged in overnight. You wake up on an empty battery, you're not charged up, you're not strong. You lack power. Um, we have to make sure we're getting his word and his will in us so that we can be strengthened. There's a difference between trying to do this Christian walk on your own power and trying to do it with God's power. You can't do this on your own. That, is, that, that means if you try to do it without the help of anyone else, you can't. It also means if you try to do it without God's help, you can't. And one way he helps, just one way, is through his word. So he says you need to be filled. Um, trying to walk in a manner worthy is difficult because the road isn't easy and we often trip over our own feet. And so we need, our, we need help and strength. And God says if we're filled with the knowledge of his will, it will help us to walk this life. Do you remember those milk commercials? I remember going to the cafeteria in like junior high and elementary school, and I hated milk. I've always hated milk. Uh, chocolate milk is great. White milk, I'm out. I've just always been that way. Um, but they, I'm sorry. One of you just looked like I killed your dog. I apologize. <laughs> How dare you? Um, as long as I can remember, at least, I didn't like milk very much, except for chocolate milk. But they used to have on the cartons, they had these commercials like milk builds strong bones. They'd have these athletes with a big old milk mustache and they'd be encouraging you to drink milk. Do you know what God calls the word in the New Testament at one point? Long for the pure milk of, milk of the word. If milk builds strong bones, God says, my word builds strong Christians. My word will build someone or help someone to live a life Pleasing to God. We should long for that to fill ourselves with so that we can be pleasing to God. And he says, you need strength to do that. God's pleased when we turn to him to get that strength to walk this walk. Then there's the last one. Giving thanks to the Father. There are three reasons mentioned for why we should be giving thanks to the Father here. They all end in E.D. He's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. Like track times. If I want to make the next race, I have to have the certain time to get there. You and I, if it comes to eternal life and a relationship with God, we are not good enough to have that. Jesus has qualified us. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He has Amazon primed us from eternal hell to eternal heaven. I mean, it is just, it's, it's shipping just like that. Uh, he has moved us from a place we would not want to be to darkness into light. And then he's transferred us. It's like we have been a part of the greatest trade in history. We have been traded from, the, from darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All of those reasons, or those three big reasons, are reasons why you and I should give thanks every single day of our life. We're not even talking about, hey, he gives me what I need to live on this earth and the family, and the friends I have, and the things we have, and how richly we're blessed in this country, and all the other innumerable blessings. He says, simply put, just what God has done for you spiritually should cause you to give thanks to Him every day of your life forever. Because He has blessed us beyond what we can imagine. He has taken our, the worst thing we've ever done, our sins, He's removed them, He remembers them no more, and He has perfected us in His blood. And He says, that's worthy of giving thanks to God. And it pleases God when you say and show your thanks to him. A simple thank you goes a long way, doesn't it? You know, moms, when you cook dinner. Dads, when you go mow the lawn. Just a little thank you sometimes gets you, gets you through a weekend, through a week, through a day. God enjoys a thank you. Verbally, but he also enjoys seeing it too. So he says, when you give thanks, that is a pleasing life to God. I, I'm not saying that's an exhaustive list or that details everything, but Paul says, I pray that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will so you would live a life pleasing to God. And there are four areas or four actions you can do that please God. And you could say, okay, does my life look like this? If you're a new Christian, there's a very basic outline of what it looks like to live a life pleasing to God. If you're a mature Christian, 
Does your life look like that? Maybe there's some areas that you go, I don't know how well I'm doing that. Or maybe I need to grow in that area. Well, there's just a reminder for you tonight, as it is for myself. Um, tonight, I just want to end with a few, a few questions for all of us. Here's, here's to me the things I, I take away that maybe you can take away too that I'm asking myself. Number one, is being filled with God's will a priority in my life? I'm talking to a Sunday night crowd. So I get it. You're here. You said, I'm going to listen to two sermons today, not just one. Some people think you're crazy for that. Uh, We're a church that emphasizes Bible class for good reason. Because you need God's word to fill you to live a life pleasing to him. But is being filled with his will a priority in my life? That, That goes beyond Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. There are far many more hours in the week. And I'm not saying you need to be someone who's got a sermon in your ear 24-7. I'm not saying that you have to be reading your Bible for hours upon hour a day, but you need to have God's word and God's will in your life in some sort of fashion consistently. Is that a priority? That's easy today. I can just binge watch a video or entertainment forever. I can go find a hobby and get lost in it forever. But how important is this to me? Do I make this a habit? Do I make that a priority? Or is something else taking that place? Another question that I ask myself is, do I want to be fully pleasing to God? That sounds ridiculous. Of course. Well, then am I making that a priority? Because if I don't make God's will a priority, there is no way I can live a life pleasing to God. They are connected in a way, Paul says here, that you you can't do one without the other. And so if we want to be fully pleasing, we have to be filled. But then here's one for me too, or another one I think about. Does my life look like Paul's description of a pleasing life to God. Am I bearing fruit? Um, You know, it's easy sometimes in our society to say, I go to church, therefore I'm a healthy, fruitful Christian. I believe with those five or six teachings, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm what God's looking for. But, hey, am I doing good works? You know, there's poor and there's hungry and there's needy. Or... Uh, There's people who need encouragement or there's opportunities to serve. And I want to pause for a second because sometimes I think we make a bunch of people who are going above and beyond in their service feel like I can be doing a lot more. Listen, some of you don't need to be doing more. Some of you need to stop doing more. Some of you are doing a lot. We appreciate it. There are some people who aren't doing anything. Maybe that's not you in this room. I don't know. They, we hope they pick it up. I just don't want someone who's overburdened already trying to fit another two backpacks on their shoulders. But am I bearing fruit? What about with my attitudes or my heart? Is, is peace, uh, joy, patience, love, kindness, gentleness, are all those things being uh, bearing in my life? Uh, another one would be, am I, am I increasing in the knowledge of God? Am I growing? Am I making it a habit in my life to grow on my own? Uh, Am I being strengthened through God or am I trying to do this by myself? How thankful am I to God? How often do I tell my God, thank you and let him know it and just talk to him about, God, you're doing so many wonderful things in my life. You've done so many wonderful things. I'm going to praise you. That's what a pleasing life to God looks like. And I sometimes look at this passion and go, oh, I need to tweak some things or it's a good reminder for me. That what's pleasing to him might not be what I think it is sometimes. And so, tonight as we look at that passage, my my prayer is that you'll, one, make it a priority to get God's will in your life. I I don't know how that's going to be for you. If you're a podcast person, there's a lot of great podcasts. Come ask me. I'll give you some recommendations. Every time I go on YouTube, Bible Talk TV is having a never-ending Bible study. Just forever. Um, It will be going until Jesus comes back, I'm afraid. I think that's how it's going to work, right? Just keeps going. You can check into that. There are books to read. There, there is a, a vast amount of ways to get God's will in your life. Make it a priority. And then notice as you're filled how it changes your life and changes your walk. And then let that produce fruit in your life. Let that strengthen you. Let it lead you to give thanks. And let it help you to come to know your Creator better and better. I pray that's a blessing for you tonight, and I hope you can take something home from that. Uh, That lesson doesn't tell you necessarily how to become a Christian. It's more for people who are already Christians, but maybe you think about the sermon this morning about being ready for what comes when Jesus returns. 
Uh, maybe you've seen other people put on Christ in baptism and it has you thinking and you want to do the same. We would love to help you. Maybe it's you're already a Christian and you simply need encouragement or help along the way. Maybe you want to repent of something in your life, confess your sin. Uh, we would love to uh, hug your neck and go to God on your behalf with you and encourage you today. If you have a need tonight, uh, come now while we stand and while we sing.